Folks, just like this little fella here, you're probably wondering what is going on. And for good reason. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave you hanging. This little fella here, he's going to be just fine. He's got a secret weapon. We'll get back to that here in a minute. I got a story to tell you. Now, no surprise to anyone that's ever woken up on a deserted island in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. The morning after Halloween, everybody was moving just a little slow. We hijacked some deserted biologist hut, which proved better than sleeping in the sand some place called Scorpion Island. And I had driven most of the fellas out, and they'd seek refuge out on the porch, lined up in hammocks like little enchiladas. Mm-mm. I love me some enchiladas. And our fearless leader, well, he found sanctuary for me as far as possible. And this is me, Bear Holman. And I snore. Now that's enough about me. We're exploring a remote atoll in the middle of the Gulf, about 120 kilometers from the mainland. Our journey actually began about seven days earlier on a tiny island they call Holbosch. And here's our two fearless leaders, Alejandro Vega Cruz and Mike Dawes. Lost in the swamp, practicing for the journey. For the past 12 years, um, my brother and I, Russo, have been basically trying to explore the unexplored. Come to know that the best experiences, they don't come easy. They don't come with a price tag. What you put in is what you get yeah. out. Yeah. I mean, tar tarpon fishing, it just, it doesn't get old. It's an amazing fish and maxes out at 200 plus. And it's ironic that uh, I like to chase the, the little guys. The casts aren't easy. They live in really tight quarters. You have to be on the A game with your cast. You gotta put it where it needs to be, period. We 
We set our base camp on the small island of Holbosch, home to group leader Alejandro Vega Cruz. We had a couple days to pack and repack and pick up any last minute supplies and just kind of settle into island life. Hola, uh yola. -oh. Like that? <laughs> the snook, ceviche. My landed tree is snook today for ceviche. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 Even the small amount of commercial fishing in the area in his lifetime had decimated the bonefish populations. Having the time to fish around civilization and a commercial fishery before heading to the Scorpion Reef, which is this really, really remote atoll with no traffic, no people, gave us this really nice perspective, gave us a nice contrast between a slightly used, maybe commercial fished area and a completely untouched wild ecosystem. There's a pretty significant difference between a hosted trip or a lodge trip and a do-it-yourself trip. And we're going on this expedition where we're kind of hanging it out there, so to speak. If we get slammed by a bad storm, if any, anything goes wrong, we don't have a lot of assistance. We don't have a lot of help. So the unknown and the fact that we're all doing this very remote exploratory, this hodgepodge of mutual acquaintances and friends, was well, kind of wild. From Holbosch, we've got a couple of days of preparation at least. And it's gonna get a little weird because we got a lot of moving parts. Sandflea is gonna run two pongos, two progresso, 12 hours running time on a tiller. Meanwhile, we're gonna take the ferry to the mainland, we're gonna go west to Merida, and we're going north to Progresso. We've gotta load up all the baggage and get ready for the 18 hour trip out to the atoll. And we're gonna put all of our worldly possessions on a, uh, a pretty rough boat. Where's, where's like the pink ball? It's really too bad you can't capture the smell of this place on <laughs> well, that camera. Not so all we have is this map, and it's from 1838. And the weird thing is Google Earth only captures this. We've got to navigate in four days of fishing from here to up to Isla Desirada and try to figure out the atoll. So look at this thing, like it doesn't give us nothing. Everything around it's deep. This could be like great flats and bonefish stuff, or it could be like 100 feet deep. So you have no clue what goes on from here to here, and that's roughly 15 miles in the atoll. Here's the ship crashing. Crashing, yeah. Crashing. This guy figured it out. This guy steered clear. This guy right here came in from the north and he was sailing southeast and he missed this one and then he crashed right here. <laughs> oh, it should be easy. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, got it. <laughs> For anyone who's ever traveled to the tropics, you're probably pretty familiar with the term island time. This trip was a combination between island time, Mexican fish bum time, and, and do-it-yourself male ego. Which means that most of us on the trip were on this need-to-know basis, which was pretty exciting. You ask somebody, you know, when do we meet the boats or where are we going to meet the boat? And they'd say, oh, don't worry, you Americans, you worry too much, you know. That we were given this van to drive all the gear to Progresso. Sanfleet went ahead with Mike and to find another crew member who was lost. 
They trusted me and Baron Bucola to get all this gear to a place that we've never been. And we have no map, the van barely works, it doesn't have any gas, we don't know where we're going. It was, it was pretty typical. Tell me about the friggin' vehicle situation here, because we got no shocks, no, no shocks, nothing. We're following. We got, about, we got about under a quarter tank of gas, we got poor acceleration, but bad brakes. problems it's uh like a hundred degrees outside we stole this minivan basically borrowed it for a little while temporarily almost ran out of gas and now we just got a bunch of stuff for uh going out to the island there and doesn't go down windows don't go down and we don't have the ac ac doesn't work so we're gonna try to reset reset the clock and everything's kind of fried so we're gonna Try to disconnect the battery. And, well, it's off, and then we're gonna try to put it back on without getting too shocked. Yeah, let me see that. All right, this that. is what keeps the back door from. Uh, oh yeah, that. Here we go. Well, that's. What are you going down? Dude, are you kidding me? <laughs> I don't know what time it is, 3.30 in the morning, and uh, we finally got the whole crew together, and we're somewhere in the port of Progresso, but uh, the guy can't find the boat, which we're supposed to get on, but uh, hopefully we find that, because uh, that would be nice. We uh, we're underway. Which is uh, which is nice. The group size is now almost tripled. Uh, we don't know who they are, but they're coming with us. Eventually, somehow, we got everything together and we got out on the water. And thankfully, on a very calm ocean and a very beautiful morning. The adventure of letting someone else not guide you, putting a group of people together, and Having these people guide themselves and go to a place where not many people have ever been, the adventure of letting go, it's a lost art. Everyone in our little group was very invested in this journey. It took a lot of cooperation and a lot of planning. And I think everyone was driven and intrigued by this concept of of going somewhere without any information and trying to figure it out on our own. But with that, there's also this giant concern. There's this fear kind of lingering, you know, for months and months leading up to the trip, and it just grows and compounds. It gets, turns into more and more anxiety about whether or not there's gonna actually be substantial amounts of game fish. Have we invested all this time for, for nothing? So when we got to the first island, everybody was blown away because you can tell immediately by looking at the water, by looking at all the different flats, that this has the potential. This could have fish. This should have fish. That, that maybe, just maybe, everything's gonna work out. Wow. What's it look like? That's, they look like the heaven, baby. This is a paradise here. This is so beautiful. And it was, it was wild. As soon as, we, as soon as we dropped anchor, you know, everybody had rod in hand, gear in hand, over the edge of the boat, down different sides of the shore. It was like a free for all. I, I don't think I've ever seen people that fired up before. I walked the first shoreline with Jose, and I think Jose probably landed the first bonefish of the trip within the first 15 minutes. Nice, dude. How's that feel? Good, yeah, good. My first bonefish in Alacranes. I think any concerns that we had about the fishing vanished almost immediately. It was like this huge weight had been lifted. I'm gonna tell you a couple of things. I don't wait, first of all, because I sink usually. My first fish, I went, I went in the water 15 minutes. My first fish was eight and a half, nine pound bonefish. Sanfully had like a seven and a half, eight pound fish. 
double up. The, the schools of bumpfish, there's two, three hundred fish in these tanks. I mean, they're giant. And uh, it's, it's the most unbelievable, pristine thing I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, dude. Double. You got one on? No, I lost. Unbelievable, man. What's up, dude? <laughs> what is up? Dude, unreal. Freaking eight pound bonefish tailing everywhere right after we get off the goddamn yacht. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was, it's already worth it. Tailing, just schools of 50 bonefish tailing all over six, seven pounds. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm gonna have the yellow. This cup, yeah. all this family. I never catch that bigger. Firmer oh. than Alacranes. In case all y'all forgot, this is yours truly. And I'm getting what we like to call down here in the south a little bit of an ass whooping. Been uh, messing with these trigger fish, been bit like three, four times, something like that, and I can't come tight. Getting frustrated with them. And like, I'm all in them, and they're like, every time, they're like, they're following it, going down on it, biting it or whatever, and I'm like, not sticking them good, or, you know, I don't know. It's just straight up flat across. There's not even a part of a loop in that. God dang it, man. Now, for some reason, I've found that fly fishing is a lot like chasing women. The, the one that you're the most interested in is the one that's least interested in what you're putting out there. And that's what's going on with these little trigger fish. But I've also found that persistence usually pays off. <laughs> Check that out, baby. Got me a trigger. Finally, uh, see, they're all beating my flies up, beating me up last two days, and uh, finally got my, my little uh, trigger fish today. Want to stick your fingers in that? Yeah. Guess you can call it my first, what, Mayan permit? Mayan permit, baby. So we were road tripping through the west, and uh, RA and Mike and I are having fish tacos out in front of the shop in Victor, Idaho. Mike and RA are talking about logistics. Mike turns to me and goes, so Spicoli, you're coming, right? And I look at him and go, never been saltwater fly fishing before, but you're goddamn right I'm coming. Then it dawns on me that uh, this is like getting a brand new pair of skis and heading straight to the helicopter and flying to the gnarliest peak and that's never been run, crazy. A two-handed rod is pretty much all that I've ever known. It's remarkable how different saltwater fly fishing is to spay fishing in the rivers. When you're spay fishing for steelhead, you get in this rhythm. You cast, you swing, you step, and it's all on your schedule. You have a lot of control over the pace of things. The biggest difference here is speed and accuracy. Everything's in constant motion. The boat's moving, the tide's moving, the fish are cruising, and you've gotta be on your game. Moving on. Let's move. Wait. Wait. Flip. Flip. No. I think you gotta go again. Yes, I can't see it. Right like a two feet in front. Okay, stop. No. Okay, flip. Flip. No. 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 Got him. Ah. Closer. Closer. Touch. You got it.
guys keep telling me uh, that's a big fish. But uh, <laughs> what do I know? So I, I'm the guy who, you know, you take your buddy who's a total rookie and uh, he swings up a 30 pound buck. I mean, he's got no idea what he's got. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'm ever gonna go bone fishing again. I mean, uh, <laughs> why would I? So before we headed out to the Scorpion, I chartered a flight from Cancun and I, I wanted to fly the area and try to get a lay of the land, take some photos and just really experience the area from the air so we could have a better sense of what we're getting into. The pilots that I flew with out of Cancun had spent a tremendous amount of time flying all over, all over the Yucatan. They had never flown over this area before. What's challenging about looking at a reef in an area like this from the air is you don't have a great perspective of how big things are, how deep water is. What looks great from the air can look totally different when you're on the ground. Looking at the islands and looking at the general area, it looked, it looked really barren. I think what really blew me away was to then get on the ground and experience the amount of wildlife, pure, untouched, totally isolated wildlife. It was a really profound experience. And it drove home this, this concept of how important these wild, untouched places are. It reminds you that if you leave a, a wild ecosystem intact and it's managed properly or left alone, how inspiring our wild places can be. This is what our world's coastline should look like. Wild, untouched places like this are so important for us to see. Humanity should never stop fighting to protect wilderness. Every single generation deserves to see places like this, places that are natural and untouched and pure. The fact that we showed up and caught bonefish, that equaled success. But Mike Dawes, well, everybody could feel that he, uh, he was looking for a little something more. Now that guy there, I, I don't really know why, 
but he's never been a real good sleeper, especially when there's permit around. Every night when everybody's getting ready to go to bed, Mike Dawes, he was sitting in the corner tying flies. Permit fishermen, they're a rare breed. He's logged over 1,500 hours fishing for permit. Now that's not counting the 3,000 hours he spent tying flies, another 1,000 hours prepping gear, and the other thousands of hours he spent traveling to tropical locations and BSing about permit and bars. Now after putting in all that time, the encounters are so rare, everything happens so fast, usually in three to five seconds that all of his experience hooking up to permit only adds up to about three minutes. In order for someone to start permit fishing, you know, someone has to be willing to spend a lot of time and spend a lot of money and never catch anything. You know, you hear people talk about the stories of fishing to catch a permit on a fly for 10 years. If you do everything right consistently, and they still don't need it, you need to feel good about that. Sanford, he was like, tails, 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 permit, permit, permit. He's kind of trying to wait for the permit to pop up. And one of them finally popped up. I got lucky and the fly went right in front of him and he ate and came tight and it just went nuts from there. I could tell right away that it was a little bigger. Sanford's like, I prefer that you stay on the flat. And I was like, we're getting in the boat and we're going after this fish. Now, as hard as everyone thinks these fish are to hook, once you're hooked up, the deal ain't done. They got a whole bag of tricks they can pull on you. <laughs> now, I don't have any underwater seeing powers, but I reckon his fly line's wrapped around a coral head. He has a decision to make. He can lose this fish that he came thousands of miles to catch, or, or he can do whatever it is he thinks he's about to do to get that fish unwrapped. It was a horrible dive. I, I don't, really don't know what I was thinking. I started to think about it in the air while I was diving. I was like, why are you diving this way? But whatever. This trip right here wouldn't have been possible without this little man right here, Alejandro Vega Cruz, also known as Sand Flea, also known as Russo, the Russian. Man, these Mexicans got a lot of names. But seriously, pretty surprising this ragtag group of boys actually pulled off an expedition out in the middle of the Gulf and made it home safe. They found and experienced some of the best fishing in the world, but more importantly, they had the best time of their lives, and that's what matters. Oh yeah, I forgot. You're probably wondering what happened in that wrestling match. Well, I told you he had a secret, and he did. The best wrestler on the island. No big deal. That guy's name, El Secreto. And I don't know about Espanol, but I'm pretty sure it means the big bear. 